Well, good morning and welcome to Worship at Gospel Fellowship PCA. My name is Matt, one of the pastors. If you are new or visiting, thank you so much for coming to be with us today. Gospel Fellowship is a Bible-believing church. We love Jesus. We're on a mission to share the good news of the gospel with the world. So if you're looking for a church like that, you found one, and we're, ve- we're very glad that you did, uh, especially if you're visiting. Hey, there's a yellow card in front of you in the pew rack, and if you, this is your first or second time, and if you haven't filled out that card, it'd be nice for you to do that for us so we could follow up with you. You can put it in the offering plate, which is outside the door to the right after the service. I want to welcome our YouTube audience. If you're watching from the interwebs, uh, glad to have you. Thank you so much. You could subscribe to this channel. You could also come to visit us in person sometime. We have worship services at 8.30, 11, and 6 o'clock p.m. So if you're anywhere north of Pittsburgh, south of Butler, east of Cranberry, west of historic Saxonburg, we'd love to see you in real life sometime Come on over and worship with us. Hey, lots of announcements to go through this morning, very important ones as well. First of all, we are hosting the Refresh Conference next weekend with Johnny and Friends, a wonderful ministry which uh, seeks to serve and care for those who are disabled. We'll be hosting the conference. It's October 2nd. Uh, Many of you are thinking about going, talking about going, but you really do need to register for this conference, and you really do need to register for it very, very quickly uh, because the registration is technically about to close. And so if, you're, ha- if you have any intention of going to Johnny and Friends, get on your phone after service or go home and get on your laptop and register for that conference. It'll be wonderful. By the way, uh, because the conference will be hosted here, it's going to shift a couple of things around. For instance, our women's book study is going to be moved to downstairs during the conference. If you're part of the women's uh, book study, you can see... Marianne for that, or you just head downstairs and you'll be able to find the room for that. I wanted to mention too that we are still looking for nursery volunteers for our nursery ministry. We have a new coordinator for that. Michelle Pizer is her name, and if you have any desire to serve in the nursery, we'd love to have you to do that. Um, next week, we are going to be we're going to be celebrating the Lord's Supper together as we regularly do on the first Sunday of the month. So I wanted to mention that so you could take this week to prepare your heart for communing with God and with the other saints here at the Lord's table. It's good to think about that as the week uh, comes up so you don't get surprised when we have to uh, or we get to come to the table to commune with our our risen Christ. Also tonight, I should mention this as well, this is exciting. Tonight in our 6 o'clock p.m. service, which is held out in the pavilion, we will be having three baptisms. So if you would like to come back and worship with us tonight, there will be three baptisms out in the pavilion at six o'clock. And Sean, I'm gonna call you up in just one second. I wanna make one more important announcement that actually has to do with the six o'clock p.m. service. Uh, We've been having three services since we reopened after COVID, and the six o'clock service we've been doing outside, outdoors, for those who have special concerns related to their health or the health of their loved ones. And so as the weather begins to get cool, and we're no longer able to hold worship services outside, we did want to announce that we're going to use the 6 o'clock p.m. service as sort of our special precautions service where we'll be encouraging masks. And I know everybody has different opinions on, on masks and relationship to all kinds of health considerations. Everybody has their thoughts on that. But we want to really serve and love and show compassion to those who have those extra concerns. And so if, we're, if you're going to go to the 6 o'clock p.m. service, we'd like to really encourage you to wear masks for their sake, for those who have those concerns. And of course, you're welcome to wear masks at any one of our services. In fact, we give them away for free in the narthex. So you can wear them anytime as your conscience leads you to do so. All right, so Sean, at this point, come on up, brother, and tell us a few things about our youth ministry. Good morning. Um, First of all, I wanted to let everyone know that God has really been blessing and growing our Wednesday nights. We had over 50 kids here uh, this past Wednesday, Uh, so praise God for that uh, and be praying for our kids that they'll be having good fellowship and that they'll also learn uh, to love and know their God more uh, through our Wednesday night ministry. In relation to that, uh, we have over 50 kids here on Wednesday nights, and we could use some more help. Uh, So if anyone is interested in helping out, we already have crafts and lessons planned, but we could use some extra people there to help the adults manage that number of kids. Uh, There are sign-up sheets in the back, so please 
uh, do sign up and come help us out with that. Uh, also, Skate Castle has finalized their calendar for the school year. And uh, we had previously advertised that it, we were going to be going there for skating on the 13th and not having Wednesday program here on the 14th. However, the Christian skate this month is a week later, so we will be going skating on the 20th, and then we will not be here on the 21st for Wednesday nights. All right, thank you. Have a great morning. God calls his people to gather together on the Lord's Day to worship him and his son, Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's be called together to worship now from Psalm 46, printed in your bulletin. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea. The nations rage. The kingdoms totter. He utters His voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. If you're able to do so, let's go ahead and stand up together. We're going to sing hymn number 524. Thy works, not mine, O Christ.
Lord God Almighty, you are righteous, holy, and true. Lord, the law that you have made known to us as you are is holy, righteous, and true. Yet, Lord, we know that it would hold no blessing to us as we ourselves are sinful. Lord, whatever we know of your holy and righteous will, it would merely in itself condemn us, for our hearts are bent towards what are our own sinful desires. Lord God, we find no refuge in the works that we would do. Lord God, we find no refuge in our good intentions to mend our ways, no refuge merely in the words of men, no refuge uh, in the pain that we would take on and inflict upon ourselves, but only in your work to forgive us for Christ's sake and to cover our sins by his work. Lord God, we do pray that you would count us as righteous uh, in your eyes only for the work of Christ, for we look to him by faith. These things we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, Paul himself in the book, uh, in his letter to the Romans, as he speaks of the Lord counting the faith as righteousness, those who look to Christ by faith, he quotes from Psalm 32 and says this, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. This is the blessing we have as we look to Christ by faith. Let's confess our faith together using a portion from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> I encourage you after the service to make use of the offering plate in the narthex, or please feel free to give online at www.gospelfellowshippca.org slash give. As we consider our tithes and offerings here from Psalm 46, verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Please stand for and let's respond with the doxology. <clears throat>
Lord God, we gather into your presence that we might proclaim that you alone are God. We put no trust in the power of man, no trust in the works that we ourselves would do, no trust in the gifts and offerings that we bring before you. So we pray that for your, the sake of your own glory, that you would glorify and exalt yourself in our midst. These things we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> to encourage one another with our verse of the month found printed in the bulletin. Psalm 42, 1 and 2. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Psalm 42, 1 and 2. Let's continue our worship using hymn 644, May the Mind of Christ My Savior. pray together. Heavenly Father, as Psalm 46 tells us so beautifully and poetically, you, God, are our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. And when we think of the fact that you are a present help in times of trouble, we know, Lord, that the moment, the very moment that we flee to you in prayer, asking for your help, so there you already are waiting for us, for you know all that we could possibly ask before we even come to you, Lord. And as the psalm describes the chaos surrounding the beautiful city, it describes the mountains and the sea trembling and shaking and stirring, and yet, God, in the, in the very city of your presence, in the very congregation of the saints, Lord, we have absolute perfect peace for we have you we have your strength we have the gladness of the river of your blessings flowing through the midst of the city and so father even as we look out over the strong walls of the tower of the fortress of your protection lord we see chaos all around and beyond our walls and yet we are so thankful father that you have us safe and secure in the very grip of your grace and so we can profess with the psalmist that the lord of hosts is with us. He is our fortress and our deliverer. Therefore, we will be still and know that you are God. We will be still and know that you are God. We will put our trust in you, our confidence, our peace is derived from you, our security. You are our very comforter. And so, Father, we thank you for all the joy that we have in the church of Christ. We thank you, Father, that tonight, 
This very night at 6 o'clock, we're going to be celebrating yet three more baptisms. We praise you for the one we witnessed with our own eyes last week right here in the service, and yet tonight the joy of three more. We're praying, Father, that you would set apart these children for your will, that you would ordain for them paths of faithfulness and service, that you would call them to saving faith in Christ just as soon as you would to draw them to yourself. And Father, even as next week is the Lord's Supper, we celebrate both, both sacraments back to back. How good is this, Father, that next week when we come to the house of the Lord, we will taste with our mouths the bread of the body of Christ. We will look upon the cup, the sign and seal of his blood for us, and we will taste and we will know that you are good. Father, we pray for the, rejo- or the refresh conference coming up. We pray that it would be a wonderful time of service and care and compassion and teaching and unity amongst members of various churches. Father, even as I say that, even as I ask for the unity amongst the churches around the world, I'm, I'm uh, directed to think back to our missionary guest last week who implored us to please pray for the persecuted church around the world. And so we take a moment today to do that. Lord, we ask your blessing and protection on those churches that are suffering far more severe and intense persecution than we are in the moment. Lord, we name off just a few countries that we can think of. We think of those in China who have been experiencing the destruction of, of their church buildings and the attempts to scatter the flocks of Christ, threatening pastors and ministers. We pray that you would uphold them in your righteous hand. Father, we, we pray for the nation of, of India that is so a multifaceted, many different kinds and tribes and dialects and religions and some more aggressively persecutorial than others and father we pray that the christians would be upheld that they would be safe that they would be allowed to gather again soon and that they would do so with joy father we think of those in north korea not even sure of how many christian congregations are able to overtly meet there and yet we pray father that you would in due time Raise up for yourself and for your own glory many faithful churches where the gospel may be proclaimed freely. And we pray for Christians in Nigeria, Heavenly Father, who are experiencing violence from other groups and sects. May you protect them, Heavenly Father, from that violence and uphold them that they may be faithful to you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. And now hear us, Father, as we say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen and amen. Church, let's go ahead and grab our Bibles. We're going to turn now to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14. We've been working here for many weeks now, going through the the life, death, and resurrection story of Christ. When you find Mark, chapter 14, let's go ahead and stand up together as the believing people of Christ, as we are recalling even now that God's Word is holy, it is infallible, it is inerrant, it is the very authority over our lives. When we hear the written Word of God, it's the same as hearing the spoken Word of God Himself. Mark chapter 14, verse 66 is our text. Listen now to the Word of God. And as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came, and seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You also were with the Nazarene. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you mean. And he went out into the gateway, and the rooster crowed. And the servant girl saw him and began again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. But again he denied it. And after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man of whom you speak. And immediately the rooster crowed a second time. And Peter remembered how Jesus said to him, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen? You may be seated. 
Well, I hate to do this to you this morning, but I'm going to take you back to that darkest period of your life known as middle school. You remember it well. If you're in middle school today, I'd just give you this word of encouragement. Life does get better than it is right now. And middle school was terrible because of the social interactions that we had. Sometimes people would pretend to like you, and then the very next day, they would pretend they didn't even know you. You remember that? You're in gym class, and you're a good athlete, and everybody's your friend, and then you go to the lunch table, and nobody even wants to sit next to you. What's happening with that? Or maybe a, one of the cute girls lets you help her with her math, lets you help her with her math, and then later on in the hallway, she won't even acknowledge that she knows your name, and your heart sunk, and you were crushed down again, and maybe you helped out with a group project in social studies class, and you helped, you came up with a key idea, you made the chart that you showed in the classroom, and then when you got onto the bus to go home from school, the very same group of kids that were in your group, now they won't even let you sit next to them in the bus, and we all felt that pain, didn't we, middle school? Thankfully, we don't do that anymore as adults, except in the grocery store when we pretend that we don't see our neighbor and we hide behind the cereal aisle and we're too busy to, to say hello at the moment. But we've all experienced, we've all in fact been on both sides of denial, haven't we? Denying that you even know somebody or they deny that they know you and we've all known that that is one of the worst pains that we can experience when somebody that we call a friend now turns their back to us and rejects us before others. And that's exactly what's happening here in Mark's Gospel. We know the story of the denial of Christ on the part of the disciple, soon to be apostle, Peter, that great apostle of the faith. And yet, it tells us in Mark chapter 14, listen to this in verse 66, as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came and seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, you also were with the Nazarene Jesus. And there's that setup. There's the scene where Peter, bold and brave, now denies that he even knows Jesus Christ, who ironically, and this is what's really interesting about this passage, Jesus is going through his own trial simultaneously to this. In fact, we might even think of these things as happening at the same moment. It's almost like a scene in a movie where it says, meanwhile, over, over at the ranch or something like that, and these two scenes are happening at the same time because it says in verse 66, and as Peter was below in the courtyard. So you need to picture it like this. Even as Christ is fending off those heinous accusations and lies that we saw in his trial before the Sanhedrin last week in our text, a G, or Peter, rather, is experiencing his own kind of trial. It's a different sort of trial. And Jesus' trial is, is legal and testimonial, but Peter's is a trial of the very heart. It's a trial of his faith. It's a trial of whether or not he's going to acknowledge publicly his relationship to Christ. And here's the even sweeter irony, if I can describe it like that. Sweet's probably the wrong word, forget I said that, but, but as Jesus is literally now beginning to feel the physical harm in verse 65, look at this, they began to beat and to spit on him and cover his face and strike him and say prophecy. Here's the irony of this, even as Jesus is now physically being beaten, Peter is, what is he doing? He's warming his hands by the fire. You see the irony there? While Jesus is beginning to suffer physically, Peter is simply warming his hands, comfortable, out, safe, by the fire. And it's at this moment that Peter sinks to perhaps his lowest level yet and denies that he knows Christ. And so this morning what I'd like to do is I'd like to look carefully at this doctrine of denial. The doctrine of denial. What happened here? What went wrong with Peter? How does this happen? Why does it why does it happen to people sometimes that they begin to deny publicly their relationship with Christ? And how can we prevent it from happening to us? That's really what we want to get to at the end of the sermon. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at this in three parts. First of all, we're going to examine what happened with Peter. We're going to look at the text and see how Peter fell in this moment. Then we're going to ask a big question. We're going to ask, why does this happen? Why does it happen to people around the world, possibly even to us? And that's the big E on the eye chart is we don't want this to happen to us. We don't want to fall. We don't want to deny Christ. And so then third, 
we're going to ask the question, how then can we prevent this from happening in our lives? That we too might, in a moment of weakness, in a moment of fear or trepidation, deny Christ publicly. We don't want to do that. And so we'll look at how we might possibly prevent that if we can at all. So the Bible's open here. Mark chapter 14 is the text. Let's just work through the passage a little bit here together. Look at some of the details. So one of the details here that you realize, of course, is that Jesus has predicted that this would happen. Uh, We saw that a couple of paragraphs before. before. I think it's four or five paragraphs earlier. If you go back to uh, Mark chapter 14 and you look at verses 26 to 31, Jesus actually told Peter that this was going to happen to him. And you recall, of course, the language in verse 31 of the same chapter when he says, He emphatically denied this. Peter emphatically denied that he would fall away. And he said, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the rest of them said the same thing. And I even mentioned when we preached on that text, how emphatically Peter said he wouldn't fall. Practically swore an oath. It doesn't say that in the text, but he's almost there. Earlier in chapter 14, and now, of course, we're going to see him do that very thing. And Peter falls Three times he denies that he knows Jesus. And so what I want to do is just kind of look at this text, and I want you to observe the fact that each of the three denials seem to get worse in one sense. The the intensity is ratcheted up in each one of the denials. So if you look at the first one, look at verse 67. Seeing Peter warming himself, there he is all comfortable by the fire. She looked at him. Who's she? It's a servant girl, the least threatening person in the scene. The person with the least physical power, the person with the least social power, she is merely a servant of the high priest. She is a handmaiden to serve the high priest. And she says to him, you also were with the Nazarene Jesus. Notice the word with. Not a lot behind it. The word with simply means that Peter probably came down the Mount Olivet. Remember, that's where Jesus was betrayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, a garden in the Mount of of olives, and she's merely saying you were with him as they came down from the Mount of Olives to the location of Jesus' trial. It's not a strong accusation yet, simply that you were with, you were there, you saw something. Are you a witness of these things? And what does Peter do? But he denied it, saying, 68, I neither know nor understand what you mean. So Peter's first line of defense is ignorance. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what you're saying. I don't understand what point you're trying to make here. You're obviously speaking at a level up here, and I'm a, I'm a dullard down here. I'm sort of an ignoramus. I don't even know what you're talking about. His first layer of defense is simply ignorance. And then in the second denial, it gets a little bit worse than that because if you look at verse, well, let's start in 69. And the servant girl saw him, and she began again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. Aha, now that's a little bit more intense. Because the first time she just said, you're with them. You're part of that scene that came down towards the location of the trial. But now she's saying something a little bit stronger, isn't she? She is identifying him as one of them. This man is one of them. He's one of the disciples. I think he's even in the inner ring. She's now identifying him publicly as one of the followers of Jesus, but 70, verse 70 here, he denied it. Now, no words are given in in Mark's account, at least. He simply denies it. That might have been he shrugged it off. It could be a denial by way of posture or his his eyes. Maybe he averted or maybe he just shrugged or said, "Mm -mm," or something like that. There's no words quoted here. But the idea here is that Peter is denying in whatever way he did, words or without words, that he is one of them. And in that sense, he's also throwing the other disciples under the bus, isn't he? Not one of them. There is a them, just doesn't include me. And then it gets a little bit worse even yet, because in verse 70, again, he denied it. And after a little while, the bystander said to Peter, certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. Now notice this, the bystanders are now picking up on this. There's more people around that fire scene. And they're hearing these little exchanges. And what's terrifying Peter is now it's not just the servant girl who's making these sorts of accusations. Now this little gathering, this little crowd is beginning to hear this. And now they're all of a sudden beginning to whisper and point and identify Peter. And here's the problem with this from Peter's perspective. 
is if you recall back on that scene at Mount Olivet in the Garden of Gethsemane, which of the disciples, do I ask you, is the one who drew out his sword and cut off the ear of the high priest's servant, Malchus? Which disciple is that? It's Peter. And you can almost feel the tension rising in his heart. He may be thinking about the fact that, who knows, maybe somebody was offended by the fact that Peter struck their friend with a sword. You think? In our television sets, we've been seeing what happens lately when mobs of groups of people get angry. And sometimes, uh, whether the politics is this or that doesn't really matter, but what happens when a mob gets stirred up is sometimes a group mentality begins to take hold that is a little bit sub-rational of where the individual person uh, might act. And so Peter is now feeling the tension of the possibility that the crowd will turn against him. And so Peter pulls out now his strongest defense. Okay, so far he's got away with the ignorance and the shrugging it off defense, but now what Peter is going to do is he's actually going to begin to imprecate himself by swearing a curse on himself. Look at the language here, verse 71. He began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. He is swearing against himself. He is cursing himself here. He's imprecating himself. God uh, you can curse me if I'm lying here is essentially the idea here. But he's saying, I don't even know the man. Whoa. Compare that again to that emphatic language we saw just five paragraphs ago. If I must die with you, I will not deny you. And now he's done that very thing. He's just done the very thing that he swore he would not do. And at this moment, the second rooster crows if your conscience will not alert you, the rooster will. Peter, you have fallen. So that's the what of this text. And now we need to look at the why. Why does this happen to people? Why would they deny the very Savior who loves them? Why would they deny a Savior as good and merciful and kind and strong as our Lord Jesus Christ. What could possibly bring a man to deny the very Savior who is, in this scene, in the process of dying for Peter? How could he possibly do that? Well, let me just throw out a few things. And before we get judgmental about Peter's weakness here, because I'm sure there's a little bit of part of us that's saying to ourselves the very thing, same thing that Peter said earlier in the chapter, I wouldn't have done that. I would have been strong. We're saying to ourselves here, even as Peter is falling, we're thinking to ourselves, I wouldn't have fallen though. I would have been strong. Wouldn't have happened to me. I would have been the fourth man on the cross. Two thieves on either side, Jesus in the center. I would have been right next to Jesus, dying with Jesus because I'm strong and Peter wasn't and I'm righteous and he's not. And as soon as we say that to ourselves, we forget about the fact that it's very possible that we may have done exactly the same thing as Peter. So why do we do it? Well, let me throw out a couple of reasons. Number one, some people are tortured for the faith. Some people are tortured for the faith. Not to get too graphic this morning, I promise I won't, but you don't know what you would do if you were stretched out on a rack, would you? You don't know. I don't know. I don't know what I would do if physical torture was imposed upon my body, how long I could withstand that if that were to be my lot to suffer for Christ that way. I don't know that I would make it five minutes. Would you? We don't know. And what we do know is that people seem to break down under torture and you can practically make anybody say, affirm, or deny anything if you impose enough physical pain into their body that they're willing to break. That happens. Didn't happen to Peter. Peter cracked a little earlier than that, didn't he? And so we can go one notch down from that. What else? Well, sometimes a real and present danger will cause somebody to deny Christ. You don't even have to get the whip uh, and use it. Sometimes just bringing it out and showing it to somebody will cause them to panic. Sometimes you don't need to actually put them on the gallows. You just take them to the gallows and let them have a look at it. And they'll break down and confess absolutely anything you want. You don't even have to impose pain on the body. Just the mere threat of it is enough to cause some to fall. So that happens too. But that didn't happen to Peter quite yet, did it? No, he fell easier than that. P 
Peter fell at this third moment here that I'm just going to call perceived threat of danger. Peter is merely perceiving that it's possible. It's not even a real and present danger. It's just theoretically possible because maybe this little bystander group is going to turn on him. And that's the moment he breaks. And some people break it even less than that. Don't they? Yeah. Now some people break at the mere possibility of social loss. If I don't get the job, if I get fired for saying the wrong thing, I might not get the job, I might not get the promotion, I might not get that teaching post at the university, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my Christian faith to the side. I haven't experienced any real persecution yet, just the very possibility that I might not get the promotion or I might get fired for what I do, and some people are all the more willing to simply put Jesus away and deny him. If not with words, at least in their actions. And then there's even less. Some people will deny Jesus simply by being embarrassed to know him at all. Many people are doing it today, aren't they? We're seeing people walk away from the faith. We're seeing people walk away from the church. We're seeing people renounce the faith that they grew up in, that they were trained in, that they were reared in. And why do they renounce Christ? Why do they walk away from the church? Merely because they're simply embarrassed of Christianity and the gospel Altogether, And we would certainly hope that none of us would break at that measly low level of mere embarrassment of Christ. Now, this controversy was one that the church had to deal with in the early days. And I want to take you back to church history for just a moment here to the controversy of the lapsed. This happened in the second and third centuries, especially under the Bishop of Carthage, a man named Cyprian, who was one of the early church leaders. And they had a a controversy about what do we do with people who fall away from the church because of the persecution of Rome? Of course, you know, don't you, that in the second and third centuries AD, the persecution of Rome began to really heat up and it moved from just kind of informal persecution to actual state level persecution a Roman emperor level official persecution. So Christians began to peel off from the church as they began to get terrified. And so the church had to deal with the controversy. What do we do with these people who fall away? And they called these people the lapsed. Lapsed, you know the word collapsed means to fall down. Same root word. The lapsed were those who denied Christ. And so they had to deal with the controversy. What do we do with these people? They broke. They denied that they knew Jesus. They, under pressure of some kind, they worship the emperor or they denied that they knew Jesus and the church had to figure out, do we let these people back in? Do we let them to the Lord's table? Do we let them take positions of leadership like pastor and deacon and elder and bishop? What do we do with these people called the lapsed? And so Cyprian, the bishop of Carthage, called together a synod of the various churches and they actually debated this. And believe it or not, uh, there were some who argued that people should have a great amount of mercy and be restored right back into the fellowship of the church. And those people who argued for the most amount of mercy, listen to this, ironically, were the people known as the confessors. They were the ones who actually stood strong under the most intense persecution and they did not break. Isn't that interesting? The people who didn't break arguing for mercy for those who did. Why? Because they knew exactly what it felt like. And so they argued that those who lapsed should be restored back into the life of the church, albeit with some qualifications. And one of the things that they did, which I think is really important, is they began to distinguish between two kinds of falling. Falling away temporarily, the lapsed, and falling away permanently, that they called the apostates. And the apostates were the ones who denied the faith, they denied Christ, they never repented, and they never turned back out of fear. They kept worshiping and honoring the emperor or Caesar instead of Christ. And this synod that Cyprian called made that distinction. I think that's an important distinction to make because that's the very distinction, church, between Judas and Peter, isn't it? If you think about it. One lapsed and fell, The other apostatized and turned away eternally. That's the difference between Judas and Peter. In fact, even in this dark moment for Peter, there is a little bit of grace in this text, right? 
There is grace because what does Peter do? Peter does three things that I think are commendable, even in this, his darkest moment. First of all, if you look at verse 72 of our chapter this morning, it says, he broke down and wept. And so no sooner does Peter deny Christ, but he immediately begins to weep and repent. He falls, yes, but one thing we love about Peter is he repents just as hard as he falls. Just as sincerely as Peter falls, so sincerely does he also repent. We don't see that in Judas. We see different actions in Judas, but with Peter, we begin to see the conscience being seared by the crowing of the rooster and the Spirit of God working upon Peter in a heavy way, and Peter immediately turns and he repents. And not only that, but he does something else. All of the Gospels indicate that after Peter denied Christ, where does he go? He goes back to the disciples, something Judas never did. Do we ever see Judas back with the disciples repenting and praying and asking for help and waiting on the power of the Spirit. No, we don't see that with Judas. But with Peter, all of the Gospels are pretty clear that Peter went right back to the disciples. He went back to the church. He went back to the saints of God. And not only that, but by the time we get to the book of Acts, check this out, Peter is one of the boldest Gospel preachers enduring persecution and difficulty that we see in the book of Acts. He's bold, He is courageous and he preaches that Pentecost Day sermon and he experiences prison and hardship because of his faith. Now, I'm not going to say that Peter never lapsed again because actually in our Sunday school class in the book of Galatians, we're going to see a moment in Galatians chapter 2 where Peter lilts a little bit again in another controversy and Paul's going to rebuke him in Galatians chapter 2. I'm not saying he's perfect from this point out, but what I am saying is that Peter does hold fast. And the one thing that we know about Peter, not from the scriptures, but from church history, is that Peter himself was ultimately martyred for Christ. Sometime between 64 and 67 A.D., Church history tells us that Peter was martyred for Christ. So when it came down to real torture and pain, Peter stood the second time. And we praise God for that. So that's the, uh, that's the why. Now let's go to the third point, which is how we can be fortified against such denials if indeed we can. Now I mentioned the distinction between the lapsed and the confessors. The lapsed who turned away from Christ under threats and the confessors who stood fast. And even as I mentioned those two categories, I'm sure there was a part of your heart, right? I mean, you felt this when I said that, didn't you? When I said confessors stood fast and held fast to faith, part of your heart said in itself, I hope that would be me. I did. I want to I stand fast. I don't know what I would do under certain conditions, but I hope I would stand fast, and you do too. You want to be a confessor. You don't want to be the lapsed. So is there anything that we can do to fortify ourselves against that kind of failure? Well, I think there are probably three things maybe that we could suggest here, and I'll tick through these rather quickly. The first thing we might do to fortify ourselves against being the lapsed so that we may be confessors is, first of all, to remember the warnings of Scripture. To remember the warnings of Scripture. Now, Peter had something, didn't he? He had the prophecy of Christ and he had the rooster crows which was going to warn him. And Peter heard the rooster the first time but he still still, uh, lilted in that moment. But, But we have warnings too. We don't have necessarily the promise of the rooster as Peter did but we have warnings, calls. We have we have warnings that echo in, in, the, in the ears when we read our scriptures. Let me read a few of them to you, and these ought to be warnings to us so that we would be terrified by ever denying Christ. We should be more afraid of what happens when we deny Christ than we are afraid of what might happen to our property or our reputation or even our physical bodies. Listen to this. This is Matthew chapter 10, verse 32. It says, So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven, but whoever denies me before men, I will deny before my Father who is in heaven. And you ought to be saying to yourself, I do not want that to happen. Like whatever else happens to me, the worst possible thing that could happen to body or soul is that Christ denies us before the Father who is in heaven. That is the worst. Here's another one. This is a warning. This is a rooster crowing to you out of Titus Chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, he says, To the pure, Paul says, all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. 
but both their minds and their consciences are defiled. Listen, they profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. And so in Scripture, we too have our roosters that crow to us and warn us. Don't turn away. Don't turn away. So we have that. But then we, here, look at this. We have something sweet too. Not only do we have warnings, but we also have promises. We have promises that God will uphold that in that very moment. I want you to turn with me in your Bible to the next chapter of Mark. Actually, two over. We're going to go from 14 to chapter 16. Jump ahead to the resurrection scene here. Look at this. Now, we don't even hear the name Peter again from the time Peter breaks down and weeps in verse 72 of chapter 14, Peter completely fades out of the scene until the resurrection. And notice this in 16 verse 7, Jesus is raised from the dead. Jesus is now showing himself to Mary and the other Mary and the women at the tomb. And look at this. It says in verse 6, And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who is crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him, but go and tell his disciples. Oh, look at this. And Peter. Isn't that good? And Peter, that he is going before you to Galilee. The Lord does not cut off Peter in this moment of failure. The Lord has not forgotten about Peter in this moment of failure. Though Peter denies Christ, Christ does not deny him in this moment. He has a special plan and a promise, yet there is still a role in redemption for Peter. And so we turn then to the promises of Christ in the gospel. And there are many, of, many promises in which God promises that he will fortify us during these times of severe difficulty. Listen to this one from John chapter 16, verses 1 to 4. Uh, Jesus says, I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he's offering service to God and they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I've said these things to you, listen, I've said these things to you that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. Promises of Christ. The promises of the gospel to uphold, them, uh, to uphold us. Here's one from Jude one twenty four. It says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. That's a benediction that we can pray on each other even in the end of our worship services. But what are we doing? We're calling upon God, aren't we in that moment, to, be, to continue to uphold us and to prevent us from stumbling and to present us before his presence, blameless. And there are many others, but before we, before we close, I want to mention just the third way that we might be upheld during these times of trial, and that would be that we might be prayed for by other Christians around the world. And here again, we come to that theme of the prayers for the persecuted church. It's their moment right now to endure these trials in various places on planet earth. It is their moment to be tested like Peter. Maybe our moment as a society, as a culture, will come later, but it's their moment now. And so wouldn't you like to know if you were experiencing the, the very tumult of that kind of a test that there was somebody out there praying for you even as you were going through this tremendous pressure and weight? Wouldn't you like to know that? I mean, picture yourself. Well, you come up with any picture you want. You're in the boardroom. You're about to get fired for your faith, maybe someday in the future. Or maybe you're in the arena, like those in the days of Cyprian, and you can hear the lions and the gladiators stirring inside the arena, and you, you know your time is coming to be tested upon you. In the very moments where the persecution becomes the most intense and you feel that you might almost break, wouldn't you like to know that somewhere around planet Earth there was a group of Christians that were praying for you in that very moment? Wouldn't you, wouldn't you like to know that? I would. And so we can pray for them today as they're struggling. Maybe they'll be praying for us one day if we do. Who knows? So we trust the great and the living God to uphold us 
with the reality that we too may be tested in dark days to come. And yet, should that come, our God is still good and our Christ is still faithful. Let's stand now for the benediction as we close. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and to give you his peace in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.